Very nice to see you, Mr. Warren. Uh, yeah. Thank you for answering some questions. What do you think of when you see the moon in the sky now? I don't really think much about uh, the moon anymore. Uh, you have to remember, it's 48 years ago. And uh, in my mind, it's a little like going to a movie. And then when you come out, uh, you're back in the real world and you think about the movie. And as time goes on, uh, many of the things about the movie become kind of in the, in the, in the, in the, in the background. Uh, but you remember the high points of the movie. And I think uh, years later, you still remember some of it. And the moon's the same way. I don't think much about the moon. Uh, I, I don't call up images of specific things that I saw on the moon, uh, but some of the larger features and some of the uh, absolutely uh, incredible features there are on the moon uh, keep coming back to mind. And um, it's, uh, it, it's not like, it's fresh in my mind, but my memory is pretty good when it comes to certain things on the moon. Uh, but looking at the moon up in the sky at night, uh, I don't think much about it anymore. Having been the person who was furthest removed from any other human, uh, what lessons could you offer to the people who are going to travel to Mars and on further journeys for their distance from humanity? Well, my response to that is patience, patience, patience. Uh, it was wonderful being by myself there for three days. I was very happy to um, fly that spacecraft by myself while they were down on the surface. I did a lot of work. I only slept about four hours a night. I had a lot of science, a lot of photography to do, a lot of visual observations to make. You know, one of the visual observations uh, that I made uh, resulted in NASA uh, changing the landing site for Apollo 17 to go where, to a spot that I had picked out, uh, oh. which I thought was kind of, kind of neat. Uh, we were looking, the, the moon is an interesting thing. Uh, it's very, very old, same age as the Earth. In fact, it probably came out of the Earth. I think that's what yep. they're beginning to think more and more. Um, so it went through a cooling period, just like the Earth did. It developed a mantle, uh, but there was still some volcanic activity. And, and, and my job was to sort out uh, the volcanic uh, features from the meteor impact features uh, and try and provide some context for that. Uh, there are several, in fact, the area where we landed, Hadley Rill, the rill itself is an old lava flow that came down from the mountain and carved out a, a, a trench uh, in the surface. Any linear feature on the moon is called a rill. Uh, and the one that we landed, that Dave and Jim landed next to, uh, was a what we call a collapsed lava tube. Um, and, and along linear, the, the difference between the gravity on Earth and the gravity on the moon is pretty spectacular. A uh, lava tube here on Earth would be 35, 40 feet in diameter, but on the moon it was uh, 700 feet across. And that's probably due to the difference in gravity. Uh, so there's some pretty spectacular features on the moon. Being isolated and, 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 and that uh, Guinness record of being the most isolated man in history, uh, I can't verify, I don't know. Uh, they say that uh, there was at a point where I was further away from the guys on the surface than anybody else. I don't know. Uh, that could be. Do you ever yearn uh, for that peace again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I liked the peace and quiet that I had when I was by myself, uh, even though I had a lot to do. But it was a lot easier to get things done without two other guys getting in the way. So I quite enjoyed the time by myself. I had a good time. Have your feelings for or about our planet today changed from those you had when you looked at Earth from a long, long way away? Not so much about the Earth. Uh, the Earth is a pretty finite piece of material stuck in solar orbit. Uh, it hasn't changed in billions of years. Uh, I had a greater reaction to looking at the universe the other way uh, because I think that's quite a bit more spectacular in a way. When you look at the universe through the atmosphere, you see a certain number of stars. Right? Stars that are uh, uh, dimmer, let's say, or less bright, uh, get absorbed in the atmosphere and you don't see them. So there's a limited number of stars that you can see through the atmosphere. But when you're around the moon, uh, in, a, in a part of the orbit where you're shadowed from both the sun and the earth, you see them all. 
there's nothing to there's nothing to attenuate the light coming in. And so what I saw was a sheet of light, not not an individual star, which I found absolutely amazing. And uh, it, it made me think more about our place in the universe than just looking at the Earth. If you look, just look at the Earth, you're, you're kind of uh, restricted to just the solar system. But if you look at the universe out there and you realize how far away those stars are, and you realize how many of them there are, then you get a little different perspective on what this is all about. Did you feel very smooth? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And it, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. If you look in the night sky and you look at the Milky Way galaxy, uh, it's a wash of light and you see individual stars and all that. But I don't think very many of us realize how many stars there are in the Milky Way. And there's like 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And then you find out that there are another couple hundred billion galaxies out there that we see as points of light because they're so far away. But they're probably about the same size as the Milky Way. So you start multiplying all those numbers out and you get to be, you get to a number that I, that nobody can comprehend. Uh, but you realize that the probability of planetary systems around stars the size of the sun is going to be a positive number. And there's going to be a positive number of those planets around those stars that are going to be Earth-like. They'll have an atmosphere, have water, and all, all, all the things we need for life. Uh, so it, it becomes pretty inescapable if you really look at the universe out there and you really contemplate what, it, what it's all about, that there's going to be a planet out there with people living on it like us. And uh, if, you, if you read Carl Sagan, he will, he, he's very clear in making the statement that there's absolutely no question in his mind anyway that there's there are intelligent people living out there but you have to understand that depending on the size of the planet they live on they're going to be different from us if the planet is smaller and less gravity they're going to grow tall and thin if the planet that they live on is higher gravity than what we have they're probably going to be shorter and thicker and more muscular so we 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 are we are a function of our heritage, but we're also a function of the environment in which we live. And the Earth has a certain specific gravity, which makes us what we are today. If the gravity were different, we'd look different. Well, talking of education, um, as you know, the Stephen Hawking Foundation is funding space camps for young right. children in English schools, uh, particularly in the north of England at the moment. And we want to take it out much further than that. What message would you have for eight, nine, ten-year-old children who are going off to space camps and they dream of traveling into space and learning about space? What message would you give to them? Well, I think for young people, they need to, they need to turn that dream of going into space into something concrete in terms of education. Uh, if they're really serious about going into space, uh, they need to be prepared for it. Uh, I am a... Uh, proponent of STEM education and I believe that the uh, age group uh, that needs that motivation is in middle school not high school and not college because once they get to college they already know what they want to do so I believe that we need to focus on those kids the 8 to 12 group or maybe a little more um, and the more we can get them into something like space camp the more we're going to get them thinking about STEM courses because they're going, to under, they're going to realize that the only way we can go into space is through science, technology, and engineering. And uh, hopefully that will turn a lot of these students uh, into STEM students later on. Uh, I, and I believe that's critical for the Western world. Uh, in the United States, we uh, graduate every year about 10% of the engineers that China does. And that's not, that does not bode well for us unless we can get more students into the STEM courses. And that tide is beginning to turn. It was the, over the past eight years in our country, we really slipped into the liberal social side of things. And so the, the hard courses, the math and engineering and science courses, uh, were taking a backseat to the liberal courses like political science and that kind of thing. And I think I, uh, we can see that that's beginning to turn around. And I, I, to me, that's a hopeful sign. I like to tell young students, it's great to think about going into space, but you will never find an attorney 
who can build a spacecraft. <laughs> okay? So if you're an attorney or an accountant or a doctor or anything like that, political scientist, uh, you're not going to be the one to build a spacecraft. It's going to be those with engineering and science degrees that are going to do that. So it's important to focus on the science and engineering when you're young. I'm going to ask you about one more thing. Sure. Um, might be a bit of a touchy subject, stamps. <laughs> it's, so what we, it, it's what it is. <laughs> we created these stamps for the Isle of Man post office and we worked with George Abbey over at uh, Johnson Space Center. And you work with George Abbey senior or junior? Senior. Okay, good yeah. man. Yeah, he, very good man. He wrote the text for the issue and he gave us a tour around Johnson Space Center with Mark Geyer and took us oh, into okay. mission control uh, while they were operating the International Space Station, oh, which okay. was amazing fun. <coughs> and uh, Roman's dad, Chris. So you um, met Mark and yeah, met Mark and he's also a good man. And he introduced us. I, to, I haven't I haven't seen any director of the Houston of the Johnson Space Center uh, that kind of measures up to what we had back in the day. Uh, with Bob Gilruth, he was he was our he was our father figure. He was everything. Uh, but I like Mark. I just don't know him very well. He's a new new guy in the job. Well, Gilruth ended up on one of our stamps because yes, in, in the stamps we've got the Apollo mission and and mission control. I saw that. Yeah. Um, do you have Max Faget on any of them? Yes, we do. Good. And George was insistent that that name had to go on. George, so on George knows. Yeah. One of them, we slightly broke the rules. We've got three names on each stamp, but uh, uh, Faget is, oh, yeah. is there just on this one here. You got Kraft, Faget, Lowe, and Phil. Well, those are the four biggies. Uh, what do you think of the of the stamps? I love the stamps. I think they're great. I hope they do well. I think they will. There's another set possibly coming out next year, what well, we, mm -hmm. we hope. Um, now, this, what's going to happen with these stamps? Well, these have, these have been released now, the Isle of Man Post Office, so they're used in the Isle of Man. They go out to collectors around the world as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sending them out to people who are involved in the missions. Uh, but they're used as part of the postage for the Isle of Man, so people okay. will be using these stamps right now. Okay. The Isle of Man sends post out around the world for lots of companies. Good. Does a percentage of that come back to the Hawking Foundation? Well, we hope so. Isn't that a great idea? I'll yes. put that to Maxine. And, uh, well, see, that, that happened uh, back in the States a long time ago when they had license plates. Yeah. Uh, for Challenger. And uh, that was a great source of income for the Astronaut Memorial Foundation for a while. It's kind of it's kind of tapered off now. Uh, but that was their basic source of income for a long time. And so it worked. But that was license plates. Stamps, I think, would be even better because more people will go after a stamp and then we'll go after a license plate. I, I agree. And we've got a set coming out next year. This, this is one small step leads up to Apollo 12, and then the next set, Apollo 13 through to 17. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly you were on one of them. Um, I think we discussed earlier on while my sister was being 15, born. Yeah. And um, uh, then we're gonna look at Skylab, the mm -hmm. Space Shuttle, and the International Space Station. Okay. Is there anything else that we should have put in there? If you wanted, if you were to pick something that you think absolutely must be on a stamp anywhere through the Apollo program, what would it be? The only thing I can think of is it would be nice to honor the uh, the large dish radio telescopes because that's where we're the SETI program. Yes, uh, I think is a very future future looking program. Uh, it's quite an operation today. There are lots and lots of radio telescopes out there, uh, and I think that that. that See, we talk about space program, but we're really talking in the past. Everything you've got here is in the past. Yeah. The future, where we are right now, is we're just doing a lot of talking. And maybe in five years we'll go back to the moon, maybe we won't. Mm -hmm. But all during that time, we've had radio telescopes out there searching for signs of extraterrestrial life. And I think that that, that might be something that you want to think about. I think 15 years ago on my PC, I had a little program running 24-7, the SETI um, program analyzing data. Uh, I worked. Uh, I worked at the research center, uh, NASA research center, uh, that started the SETI program out at Ames Research in California. And uh, from a very small start, they, I think it become pretty important. But you know, it keeps making me think about stories like Contact that Carl Sagan wrote um, about reaching out there, and they did that by first picking up a radio signal. From outer space, and I think that that's probably going to happen someday. So we need a we need a third set, which would be 
um, after uh, International Space Station, then leading on to the Falcon Heavy and all the other commercial ones Wait, setting well, up. But yeah. looking out, looking out. They are, they are. I think um, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are much more visionary than even the people in NASA are. I think the problem is the people in NASA are tied to a budget, they're tied to oversight, they're tied to congressional review, they're tied to a lot of things. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos can have a dream and go after it and nobody can stop them. So I, there, there, there's a chance that they could do a lot of things before the government does. Uh, I think, uh, I'm, I hope Elon Musk can do what he what he's trying. He's, he's got this star hopper thing that he's uh, building up. That's the, you know, that's down in South Texas. Uh, he's not going to launch that from Kennedy Space Center. Jeff Bezos has a couple of launch sites also, one out, I think, in New Mexico, and they're both going to launch from the Cape. I've seen the Blue Origin building at the Cape, and it's the largest building now at the Cape. Uh, they're going to completely build their spacecraft and everything right there. And to me, the most exciting thing going on in the UK today uh, is Reaction Engine. Yes. Uh, to me, that's exciting. Uh, I, I happen to have the opportunity to go to Reaction Engines when the day that Alan Bond retired and say hello and talk to them and see what they were doing. And I was very excited about what they're doing, trying to do. It's going to be a very complicated project, uh, but they've already tested the engine at, uh, at supersonic speed. So uh, well, let's hope thing, that it works. That's another thing that should be on the stamp then. So, uh, I would think Reaction Engines is the biggest thing that England's got going for it right now, right. I believe. There, there, there are some space programs, uh, but if we could ever get to horizontal takeoff to orbit, that will absolutely revolutionize space travel. Uh, Spaceport Cornwall, uh, that's uh, one of the big yep. questions for them. Yep, yep. I think that's going to be wonderful if they can put that together. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great pleasure. to meet you.